Hey guys, my name is Tensor. Welcome to part eight of the Golang blockchain tutorial series. Today we're gonna to be building a Merkle tree for this blockchain application. And we'll mainly just be finishing off the transaction system so that we can move on to adding a network system to the blockchain. There are a few minor things that we've skipped thus far that I just want to rectify with this application. And firstly, I've mentioned a few times that when a user starts to mine a block, they're supposed to get a Coinbase transaction. Of course, this functionality isn't currently in our blockchain, so let's go ahead and add it. While we're in here, let's delete this setID method for the transaction structure because we have the hash method, which does a better job. Then down inside of the Coinbase transaction method, we can just say TXID equals TX hash to give the Coinbase transaction a hash for the ID. The main thing that we want to do to change this method is to make it so that each of our coin bases has some kind of random data inside of it when it gets created. Currently when we create a coin base transaction the data comes out and just says coins to and then the user that's mining the transaction. Instead we can go ahead and use a random generator to generate a bunch of bytes inside of a slice and then use it to create a string. So first we'll create a variable called random data and we'll use a make function to make a slice of bytes of length 24. Then we can just use the random reader, which is the random number generator, to generate 24 random bytes inside of this data structure. And then we can convert the bytes into a string by using s sprint f and the percent %x sign. So now when we create a Coinbase transaction, it will have a bunch of random data inside of it. And this will make it so that each of our Coinbase transactions will send out a reward when they get mined. And actually I'm going to decrease the reward so that we do not have a large amount of tokens floating around in our blockchain. Let's make it so that when a user mines a block, they get 20 tokens. So we'll just put 20 into this new TX output method. Now inside of the command line module, we want to edit the send method. So currently we take the to and from address as well as the amount that needs to be sent around and we create a new transaction using that information. We also want to create a Coinbase transaction and because the user who's sending the transaction or creating the transaction is the one who's mining it currently in our blockchain, we want to create the Coinbase for that user. So we can create our Coinbase transaction like this. We can just say CB transaction equals blockchain Coinbase transaction, pass in the from address, and then pass in an empty string for the data. And now we can just add the Coinbase transaction to our call to add block. So here we're putting in the Coinbase transaction and the transaction that we're creating with send, and then we're mining it using the add block method, and then we're updating the UTXO set with this block. Down inside of our blockchain.go file we've got this verify transaction function. We want to make it so that it goes through and verifies the Coinbase transaction always. So we can use the isCoinbase method that we have and we can then just return true every single time the transaction that we're trying to verify is a Coinbase transaction. And this will make it so that the transaction gets verified by default. Now let's talk about Merkle trees. Merkle trees are essentially another optimization mechanism much like the UTXO set. I mentioned in the last tutorial that the full Bitcoin database takes up about 200 gigabytes of disk space. Now because Bitcoin itself is decentralized, every node inside of the network must have its own independent and self-sufficient node which will store a copy of the blockchain. As Bitcoin grew, more and more people had to get a full node on their machine, and it became less likely that people would really want to install such a large program just to access Bitcoin. Also, full-fledged nodes have certain responsibilities on the network. For instance, full-fledged nodes need to verify transactions and blocks, and not every user who uses a blockchain wants to do these things. In the original Bitcoin white paper, the main solution for this problem was what's called a Simplified Payment Verification System, or SPV. The SPV is essentially a light Bitcoin node that doesn't need to download the entire blockchain and it doesn't verify blocks or transactions. Instead, it finds transactions in blocks and it's linked to a full node which will retrieve the necessary data for it. 
The idea is that you can run a ton of light wallet nodes on top of just one full node. So maybe 100 people have the entire blockchain database on their machine, and then maybe 100,000 people have just wallet applications on their machine that use this SPV system. For this SPV system to actually work, there needs to be a way to check if a block contains a transaction without actually downloading the block itself. And this is where the Merkle tree comes into play. Merkle trees are used by Bitcoin to obtain transaction hashes and they're saved inside of a block header and it's considered by the proof of work system. Up until now we've just kind of concatenated the hashes for each of our transactions into a block and then applied a SHA-256 algorithm to them. This is perfectly fine and it's a good way of getting a unique representation of the transactions inside of a block, but it doesn't have the benefits of a Merkle tree. A Merkle tree looks like this diagram here. If we have, say, four transactions inside of a block, transaction one, two, three, and four, then the corresponding Merkle tree will look something like this. We'll have four branches to the tree, branch A, branch B, branch C, and branch D. Each one will correspond with one of the transactions, and it will be a SHA-256 hash of that transaction. Branch A is just transaction one pushed through a SHA-256 algorithm, and the same goes for branch B, C, and D. And then above branch A, we've got another branch where we take branches A and branch B and we add them together and then we run them through a SHA-256 algorithm. The same goes for this branch over here where we're adding together C and D and pushing them through this algorithm. And then finally we get up to the Merkle root where we take all of the branches below, we add them together and we run them again through a yet another SHA-256 hashing algorithm. One of the main rules of a Merkle tree is that the leaves of the tree must always be even. So if inside of a block we only have three transactions, what will happen with transaction four is that it will actually be a copy of transaction three. So we can have transaction one, two, three, and then transaction four will just be transaction three copied, and then we'll do the same exact process. Now when I talk about summing the hashes together, I'm just talking about concatenating the two hashes to one another. So for instance, for this branch, we take transaction 1's hash and transaction 2's hash, we concatenate them together, and then we run them through another SHA-256 algorithm. The main benefit of using a Merkle tree is that we can just look at the root of the tree itself to verify if a certain transaction is inside of the block. So we can just download this piece of data and this will tell us that we have transaction one, transaction two, transaction three, and transaction four inside of the corresponding block. Let's now take a look at some of the code for a Merkle tree. So I've created a new file here called merkle.go and inside of it I've created two structs. One of them is the Merkle tree structure, which just contains one field called Merkle root which contains a pointer to a Merkle node, which is this second struct down here. The Merkle node structure is recursive in that we've got two fields inside of it which reference other Merkle node structures. One is the left side and then the other one is the right side. And the idea is that we have this recursive tree structure and then each of the nodes inside of our tree also has the data associated with it. And the Merkle tree is actually the root node linked to the next nodes which are in turn linked to further nodes and this goes on and over and over until we have all the nodes that we need to represent the transactions in our block. Let's create some functionality for these structures. First let's start out with a function which will allow us to create a new Merkle node. We can check to see if the left and right nodes exist and if they don't exist then we just want to make a hash and put it into the data field of the Merkle node. Otherwise, we want to take the data of the left node and the data of the right node, concatenate the two together, then run them through our SHA-256 hashing algorithm, and then put that hash into the data field. After all of these if checks, we can just take the left and right nodes and assign them to the node left and the node right and then return a reference to the node itself. 
Again, all of this is very recursive and it works quite a lot like the Merkle tree that we outlined here where we're just taking the data in each of the branches and running it through a SHA-256 algorithm, then concatenating the two together and running them through a SHA-256 algorithm and so on and so forth. Now let's build a function which will allow us to actually create the entire Merkle tree itself. First, let's create the nodes for our Merkle tree. And remember, our Merkle tree is just essentially a bunch of Merkle nodes. Then we want to check to see if the data that's being passed in here is even. So we can check to see if the length of our data structure can be modded by two and give us zero. And if it can't, then we can take the last piece of the data and concatenate it to our data structure to make it even. Let's now start to create the new Merkle nodes for our Merkle tree. We'll start with the tips of our tree. So these pieces down here, we're gonna pass in the transaction data and then they will be passed through the SHA-256 algorithm. But remember these branches here do not have a left and right branch. So we'll put in nil for the left branch and nil for the right branch. So we iterate through the data and then we put in nil for the left branch and nil for the right branch and put the data into this new Merkle node function and then append it to the nodes value that we've created up here. Now let's create two for loops so that we can iterate through our nodes and then connect them all together into a tree shape. So first we wanna create a for loop which goes up the left side of our tree. So we'll start with zero and then we'll divide the length of our data by two and then we'll increment i by one. And then for the for loop inside, we'll start at zero and this will go the length of our nodes variable and it will be incremented by two every time. As we're iterating through things, we want to create levels, which will be arrays of Merkle nodes. And then inside of J, we'll call our new Merkle node function on the nodes data structure with an index of J, and then on the nodes data structure with J plus one. So the left value will be J, and then the right value will be J plus one, and then we'll pass in nil for the data. Then we can append all of these nodes into the level structure, and we can replace our nodes variable with the level structure. Finally, we can create the new tree by just passing in the nodes with index zero into the Merkle tree for the Merkle root, and then we can return the tree from our application. So this function may seem a bit complicated at first, but really it's not that difficult. We're just going through and we're creating the Merkle tree one piece of data at a time. And then we're finally getting all of the nodes and we're concatenating them into one final value, which we can then put into the tree, which will be the actual root of the tree. And that's actually all we have to do to build the Merkle tree structure for our application. So let's now add it to our block structure so that our blocks will be represented using this Merkle tree structure. And the way that we can add it here is by inserting it into the hash transactions method. First, we can delete this TX hash variable. And then where we're iterating through our transactions, rather than calling the hash function on them, we want to call the serialize method on them. Now, rather than taking all of the transactions and joining them together, and then using the SHA-256 algorithm to get a representation of them, we can create a Merkle tree instead. So we can take the transactions which we appended together here and then just pass them into our new Merkle tree function like this. And then we can just pass back the trees root nodes data field rather than passing back just the TX hash like we were before. So now the root of our tree will serve as the unique identifier for each of our blocks transactions. Keep in mind that when we create a block, we create it inside of this create block function. And this new proof here goes and it runs this init data function, which takes the previous hash and the hashed transactions, which we just changed into our Merkle tree, as well as the nouns and the difficulty and combines all of them together. 
So now when we run anything inside of our blockchain and when we create a transaction, it will be represented using this Merkle tree data structure. So let's test to see that all of this still works properly. First we'll create a few wallets, then we'll create the blockchain on one of these addresses. And now after playing around with the chain quite a bit, let's take a look at what it actually looks like. So here's our Coinbase transaction. You can see the pub key is this random string of values. And then the value of the transaction is 20. So when the user mined this transaction, they got 20 tokens. Then in the next transaction, I sent five of those tokens to the other account. So you can see here, we now have two outputs. One has a value of five and the other one has a value of 15. But we also have our other Coinbase down here, which has a value of 20. So now we can check the two balances for our wallets. One of them has 35 because they mined both the Genesis and then the second blocks transaction. And then the other one just has five because they received five tokens from this user. All right, guys. Well, I know this tutorial was a bit shorter than the other ones, but I hope you enjoyed it nonetheless. If you did, feel free to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the box below. And if you disliked it, then by all means, downvote it as much as you like. Have a good night.